All right. So we left off talking about the economic difficulties that hit uh, England, especially uh, the, the European continent uh, after 1873. All right. So in the 60 years before the outbreak of World War I, the middle class came to be the dominant force in European life. They're the largest consumers of goods, and with the rise of the middle class, um, <clears throat> these are individuals who have money to spend. They don't have titles. Uh, they're probably not going to own land simply because, you know, <laughs> land ownership in Britain is very difficult. You have to have a lot of money, and uh, families don't often sell. So these are people who, uh, again, were not going to be landowners, not going to be members of, you know, the parliament, but... They had money and they wanted to spend it, okay? 1851, we have the London Exhibition and the famous Crystal Palace. There's a picture of it right there. So this building made completely out of crystal. And uh, it was kind of a showcase. Uh, this was the uh, middle-class lifestyle kind of uh, in uh, true form because people uh, came and saw goods they wanted to buy and uh, they started buying them. They started spending their money. So the middle class in Europe never perfectly homogenous and diversity actually increased. Um, what we have is the owners of large businesses, small entrepreneurs, professionals, non-manual workers like teachers, and then a new, a new group called the petite bourgeoisie, okay? These are working class people who had middle class aspirations. So even though they were working class with jobs, they spent the money they made to quote unquote, keep up appearances. We actually call this term conspicuous consumption. So, you know, you don't need to buy the, uh, the brand new, uh, you know, Dodge Charger, but you do every year because you want to show people that you have the ability to do so. So yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's a petite bourgeoisie, conspicuous consumption. And there's a lot of tension between these groups in the middle class all the way up until World War One. All right, the urban growth uh, in Europe is gonna continue during the last half of the 1800 cities in Europe are going to start growing exponentially. And this is one thing that, that still exists today. Most people in Europe live in urban and suburban areas, okay? In America, suburban areas is now our majority, okay? It used to be urban areas, uh, but for a long time it was rural, up until 1920. All right, so 44% of French people lived in cities, 60% of Germans lived in cities. And again, by the rural Europeans moving to the cities, they will prompt a significant redesign in many of these cities. Uh, most of the European cities have been built haphazardly, very little planning, just you know, expanding as they could. A uh, good example would be Independence, where we live, very similar. It was added in sections, which is why um, <clears throat> some of the streets don't make sense. For those of you who live uh, in Salem East like me, you've got you know, East 18th Terrace North, and then south of 24, you've got, you know, East 18th Street, Court North Drive, whatever, you know. So, <clears throat> yeah, that's what happens when you don't build cities with planning. Good example of this was Paris, okay? There's some pictures of Paris in the old days. Um, <clears throat> uh, it was very, the streets were very narrow, very crowded, very filthy. They'd been the battleground for all the different revolutions from 1789 to 1830, 1832, 1848, 1871. And the Seine, which was the you know river that flows through the city, is basically an open sewer. And you can see a picture of it over there. Okay, so <clears throat> when Napoleon III uh, took power, one of the things that he was concerned about was Paris. And he will begin a redesign of the city in the 1870s. By this time, whole districts had been leveled to create those wide boulevards. This is a famous picture of the, this is the Arc de Triomphe. And if you notice all the roads extending out like a spoke of a wheel, um, this is actually, you know, something they do in DC too. Washington DC is very similar to that. Um, <clears throat> but those boulevards in Paris that they are famous for actually didn't exist till the 1870s. And again, the idea of the boulevards was actually pretty practical. It would hopefully prevent citizens from building barricades like they had been doing in the old days. Okay, so the barricades hopefully would, would end, and really it has. Uh, Paris hasn't had rebellions like that since. Under the Third Republic, mechanical trams and a subway system were added. <clears throat> and again, um, more public works projects create jobs and have easier access to the suburbs outside the city. And we're going to start to see the growth of the suburbs. Though, as I mentioned in here, suburbs in Europe, very different um, than ones in America, how they grew. But again, part of that is because of the history involved. All right, <clears throat> urban sanitation. So <clears throat> the growth of the middle class is going to combine with improvements in urban design, and we're going to see improvements in sanitation in these cities. Okay. Um, <clears throat> as we mentioned, European cities were known for their conditions. They were pretty deplorable. 
one of the biggest health concerns was cholera, okay? Um, <clears throat> cholera would hit European cities. It also was in American cities this time. Uh, it happens when you have unclean, untreated water. So basically water that has been, you know, infected with people's waste. And so <clears throat> there was a push in the 1800s to create sewer and water systems to keep people healthy. Um, one famous story, there was a, uh, a public water pump on Broad Street in London, and uh, it took them a while, but they figured out that these cholera outbreaks were happening because of this pump. And they tried to shut it down, and the people in the neighborhood said, this is our only you know, water, we will take the risk. And they finally had to literally <laughs> barricade the pump and guard it to protect people from using it, okay? And they were right. There was a, a massive outbreak of cholera that was linked to it. Uh, Britain and France each passed their own public health laws to stop these epi epidemics. By the turn of the century, we've got germ theory, thanks to Louis Pasteur and Joseph Lister and Koch. And again, this will aid the reformers because we now know that germs are the cause of this disease, not, you know, miasma or other you know weird ideas that <laughs> that existed for the middle ages uh, also going to push for housing reform uh, they want to end the slums and improve housing for lower class and the poor and the leading countries in this by 1914 will be great britain france and germany all right so women in the 19th century again um, another oops sorry another difficult decade uh, and dif difficult century. Um, in most European countries, women were not allowed to own property in their own names, but they could before marriage. So they could come into the wedding, into the you know marriage with property, but then once they married their husband, essentially their property came under his control, okay? And so again, this puts women at a significant disadvantage when it came to earning wages. Uh, property reform will come slowly. France will pass the Married Women's Property Act in 1882, but it only applied to certain situations. And it wasn't until 1900 that we see some really big changes. Um, for divorce, you know, if your husband's treating you horribly. Um, in France, it was actually illegal to get a divorce between 1816 and 1884, okay? Um, for most women, it was beyond their means to try to do that. In Germany, you had to prove adultery or severe mistreatment in order to get a divorce. In Britain, you had to actually get an act of parliament. Yes, parliament had to act on your marriage in order to end it. So again, making it very difficult. Um, educational opportunities for women were very lacking. They really felt like, at least the, those in charge, that only basic schooling was needed to run the household or educate the children, and therefore much beyond you know, a basic level of reading, writing, and arithmetic was not needed. Uh, university restriction or education would be restricted to men until the latter part of the 1800s. So if you wanted to go to a university, you couldn't even do so in many countries. All right, so again, the rationale for denying education to women was that the women had to have their gender roles, okay? Um, <clears throat> that there were, you know, certain roles they should follow. The jobs that were open to women tended to be teachers, social workers, nurses, things like that. Few women were able to get involved in medicine, but the field of law was restricted until after World War I. Working class women and poor women could only hope for work jobs in factories or as washerwomen. Um, as we start industrial expansion, though, we'll get things like telephone operators, typists, things like that. Um, but again, middle class, upper class women, once they were married, most of them were left their jobs and withdrew from the labor force because that was the expectation. Also applied sometimes to working class women if the husband could afford it. But working class women, poor women, were likely to be drawn into poverty and prostitution. Uh, if there weren't jobs available, prostitution did pay. Obviously, there's a reason it's called the world's oldest profession, but obviously it came with a mm, great deal of risks. Um, most prostitutes worked in the cities where there were army garrisons or in large port cities like London, Edinburgh, Glasgow, you know, places where there's going to be a <clears throat> number of clientele, soldiers, sailors, things like that. All right, so... The income gap between working class and middle class women will start to increase even more than it was before. Um, <clears throat> middle class women more likely to move to the suburbs and have servants and domestic staff waiting on them. Uh, middle class women's uh, change from being involved in the family business. You know, we talked about how uh, in these early merchants they lived above their shop and you know the women helped keep the books and things like that. Um, they will go to being solely responsible for the household and the children. And by the way, there is a term for this, the cult of domesticity, which was basically the idea that women should, you know, could only truly be happy as wives and mothers. That's it. 
Um, women married young. Most marriages were arranged by families of the bride and groom. And in fact, marrying for love was considered dangerous to social stability. And as I put in there jokingly, hence the reason for every plot of every Jane Austen novel. Yeah, they didn't want you marrying for love because that was dangerous. Love would fade. You had to find a, a good match, someone you could match well with. Um, religious groups, of course, reinforced the notion that women were the keeper of the household and encouraged charity towards the downtrodden and things like that. And then beginning at this time, and again, we won't get into the details in this, middle class families will start limiting the size of their families. They will start using what we call family planning methods. Please don't look them up. But yeah, they started using those ideas of, you know, try to regulate birth and essentially regulate the number of children because, again, children cost money. And the more children you have, the more likely it's going to eat into your profits that you're making as a family. All right, feminism. Uh, political feminism uh, is going to start as a movement, but it's going to struggle in the beginning. Um, there was a lot of controversial statements. Um, with regards to suffrage, which is the right to vote, both conservatives and liberals had concerns over giving women this right. Conservatives were thought that traditional values uh, you know, could be ruined. Liberals felt that women's vote could be manipulated by unscrupulous men, that men could you know, convince them to vote for someone they shouldn't. Uh, the first feminists were Mary Wollstonecraft and Harriet Taylor and her husband, John Stuart Mill, who uh, also supported the effort. And all three felt that women deserved the same voting rights that men had. Um, Britain had the most effective feminist movement. Uh, in 1908, the National Union of Women's Suffrage was founded by Millicent Fawcett. She's the one at the bottom there. Uh, <clears throat> and then it was led by middle and upper class women. And if you remember the original Mary Poppins, when the mom comes home, you know, votes for women, step in time. Yeah, that's that's what she is. She's a <laughs> she's a feminist. She's a suffragette. Okay, and then that is the other term that came to be known as because they were pushing for suffrage. Um, <clears throat> Fawcett, Emmeline Pankhurst, Christabel, and Sylvia. They started calling them suffragettes, and it kind of became a negative connotation. Oh, you're a suffragette, but it meant that you were advocating for women's rights. All right, when we pick up next time, we'll continue with feminism, and then we'll get into other groups.